In this episode, you'll learn about the five main managerial activities, how to increase managerial output through leverage, delegation, and time management, the correct number of direct reports to have, and how to deal with interruptions. But before we dive into that, let's first understand what a manager's output is. As a manager, you must form opinions, make judgments, provide direction, allocate resources, and detect mistakes. But these are not your output. These are activities that can positively or negatively impact your team's output. As a manager, your output is equal to the output of your organization plus the neighboring organizations under your influence. This is because work is done by teams. You can do your individual work well, but that is not enough. If you have people reporting to you, your output is the output created by your team and associates. Even if you don't have any direct reports, if you gather and share information, you're a manager. More specifically, a know-how manager, and your influence on neighboring teams can be huge. The most important thing to understand is that the individual work you do as a manager is not output. You need to focus on improving the output of your team and the teams you influence. Output can be positively or negatively impacted through one or more of the five managerial activities. One, information gathering, reading reports, customer complaints or memos, and talking to people inside and outside of the organization. This is the basis of all other managerial work and where you should spend the majority of your time. Two, information giving, conveying knowledge to members of your team and groups you influence. Beyond facts, you must communicate objectives, priorities, and preferences. This is extremely important because subordinates need the context to know how to make decisions. Three, decision making. Occasionally, you'll make a decision. Prefer to participate in decision-making by offering input, forcing better choices to emerge, reviewing decisions, and providing feedback. Decisions come in two forms. Forward-looking decisions, such as deciding an activity set, and responses to developing problems, which can be either technical, e.g. quality control, or involve people, like talking someone out of quitting. Four, nudging. You shouldn't always provide instruction. Instead, nudge people toward a preferred course of action. And five, role modeling. You are a role model for your organization, subordinates, peers, and even supervisors. Each of these activities can improve output, but you need to spend time where leverage is the highest. For some, this is in large groups. For others, one-on-one in a quieter, more intellectual environment is best. For every activity you perform, the output of your organization should increase by some degree. The extent to which it increases is determined by leverage. Leverage is the measure of output generated by a given activity. The higher the leverage, the more output a given activity produces. But not every activity increases output, and doing more can often reduce output. That's why the key to high output is focusing on increasing leverage, not activity. In summary, you can increase managerial productivity in three ways. One, by doing things faster. Two, by improving the leverage of existing activities. And three, by shifting the mix of activities from low to high leverage. High leverage activities affect many people, change a person's activity or behavior for a long period of time based on a brief interaction, or they impact a large group's work by providing critical pieces of information. It's important to flag that leverage isn't always a good thing. Just as high leverage activities can dramatically increase output, high leverage activities done poorly can dramatically reduce it. A great example of this is managerial meddling. If you constantly assume control of a subordinate's work, 
they'll show less initiative in solving their own problems and instead refer the work to you. The art of management is selecting and concentrating on one, two, or three high leverage activities and ignoring the rest. Delegation is an essential part of management. Given a choice, do you delegate activities you are familiar with or those that you aren't? Before answering, consider that delegation without monitoring is abdication. When you delegate, you are still responsible for the task's completion. Monitoring the delegated task is the only practical way of ensuring that, and it's easier to monitor what you know, so given the choice, delegate activities you know best. But monitoring should not be confused with meddling. Your goal is to check in to ensure the activity is proceeding along as expected not to do the work yourself. Like any production flow, monitor at the lowest value stage. Review rough drafts, not final reports. A second principle we borrow from production is variable inspection. Employ different sampling rates for different subordinates. How often you check in should be based on the subordinates' task-relevant maturity, not what you believe they can do in general. As task-relevant maturity goes up, you monitor less often. Finally, go into details randomly. Checking everything is equivalent to stopping the production line to check for faults. Remember, always opt for in-process tests over those that stop production. A great deal of your time as a manager is focused on allocating resources, manpower, money, and capital. But the single most important resource you can allocate is your own time. Your time is the only truly finite resource you have. Improving how you handle your time is the single most important thing you can do to increase output. You can manage your time better by applying production principles. 1. Identify the limiting step. Determine what is immovable and manipulate more flexible actions around it. Two, batch similar tasks. Everything requires a certain amount of mental setup. Efficient work relies on grouping related activities. Three, build to forecast. The majority of your work should be by forecast, and the medium is your calendar. Most people treat calendars as a place for orders to come in. You should use it as a production planning tool. Schedule work that is not time critical between the limiting steps of your day. And just as a factory manager says no to additional jobs if the factory is at capacity, you should say no to tasks that would overload your system. Four, say no earlier. Stop work before things reach a higher value stage. Five, allow slack in your schedule. One interruption shouldn't kill your entire day. Six, carry a raw inventory in the form of projects that don't need to be finished now, but would increase your team's productivity over the long term. This also prevents you from meddling in your subordinates' work. And seven, standardize. While continuing to think critically about what you do and the approaches you use. Too few or too many direct reports reduces your leverage. If your work is supervisory, aim for six to eight direct reports. This ensures half a day per week for each subordinate. As a know-how manager, Aim for six to eight subordinates or equivalent internal customers. Anything less than six to eight direct reports will result in on-the-job retirement or managerial meddling. Do everything you can to prevent starts and stops in your day. Even if there is an emergency, think about creating indicators that would have provided insight into the problem before it became time sensitive. Your work relies on working with other managers. You can only move toward regularity as others do. Do your part by scheduling recurring meetings at the same time each week. Uncontrolled interruptions are inevitable and most frequently come from subordinates and people outside your team whose work you influence. 
force frequent interrupters to make an active decision about whether the issue can wait. Block out your calendar with a note that says, I am doing individual work. Please don't interrupt me unless it can't wait. But understand that interrupters have legitimate problems that they need solved. That's why they're asking you. To reduce interruptions, batch them into an organized, scheduled form, such as scheduled meetings, one-on-ones, or office hours. If held regularly, people will batch questions instead of interrupting you whenever they want. And just as a manufacturer produces standard products, you should pin down the common types of interruptions you get and prepare standard responses. Finally, use indicators to reduce the time you spend dealing with interruptions. A good set of indicators means you can answer questions quickly and without the need for ad hoc research. The key is to impose a pattern on the way you handle interruptions.